Hey there, you're watching TechCrunch TV. I'm Colleen Taylor here with me in the studio. I'm very pleased to have the chief executive of a quantum computing company called D Wave. Uh, this is Vern Brownell. Uh, normally, you guys are based up in Vancouver. British Columbia. Yeah, yeah right. So um, it's a big deal for you to to come here. Uh, but oh, we're I suppose down here a lot. exactly because yeah. you have a lot of uh, big uh, business down here. You, earlier this fall, you sold a machine to Google. Um, Google and NASA. Yeah. Google and NASA down here in yeah. Silicon Valley. Uh, and just to get started, for anyone out there who doesn't know what D-Wave does and what sure. quantum computing is, uh, do you have sort of an elevator pitch of, of what sure. it is that you make? Yeah, I'll talk about quantum computing, which is a really interesting, somewhat mysterious subject sometimes. I mean, it really is about leveraging lo these laws of quantum mechanics to do computation. And quantum mechanics are kind of the most fundamental laws of the universe. So you're tapping into nature to do these very, you know, very complex calculations. And it sounds like it's a relatively straightforward thing, but people have been trying to build this for, for a very long time. And the promise of quantum computing is really to allow for an unprecedented speed up over the way class, we call it classical computing, which is all of today's computing that's been so successful in all of our lives. There are certain problems with cl which classical computing is not well suited for. And that's our focus area, really these complex you know, problems that, that affect humanity, and, but there's a wide variety of different uh, applications for quantum computing. So the, the researchers have been working on quantum computing, trying to implement quantum computing for over 20 years now. And the progress has frankly been kind of slow, and uh, we, we're, we're proud to be the first commercial uh, company that's actually built a quantum computer and, and sold it to customers like, like Google and NASA and Lockheed Martin and so on. So. And so the, the one key to quantum computing is that it allows bits to be both on and off at the same time because yeah. at the quantum level things don't behave the way that normal things do and, and everyone knows that computers are made of or code is, is built ones and zeros either something's on or off but you say that your qubits at quantum bits can be both yeah that's that, that's that's exactly right how the heck so, is that possible yeah well that's that's one of those mysterious laws of quantum mechanics so you uh, you can have a particle that's in effectively two places at the same time or two states at the same time those are all legitimate real rules of, of quantum mechanics and it's called superposition. So these qubits, quantum bits as you said, are really in this superposition of zero and one at the same time. And that's an interesting phenomenon, but it doesn't really get interesting until you can string those together and do something useful with them. So for instance, we have two, 512 qubits in our, in our latest generation chip. And if you think about how this computer computes, it's actually going through two to the number of qubits calculations each time it does the equivalent of like a clock cycle in, in a computer. So you can imagine two to the 512 is 10 to the 150th power. There's only 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. So every single time this machine does a calculation, it's exploring an answer space, all those possible answers to get the right answer. So it's really leveraging these mysterious properties like superposition, there's others called entanglement and so on, that, that are all fundamental laws of, of, of quantum mechanics. But what we've done is basically put them together, built a chip that, that does these calculations, and then put this chip in this really big exotic environment that has to run down at very cold temperatures and so on, uh, to tap into, to allow that quantum mechanical computation to happen. What applications is this best used for. Yeah, so the, the, the problem uh, that the computer solves is a very complex one. Some computer scientists sometimes call it an NP-hard problem. It's uh, something that scales exponentially with a number of variables or interrelationships with it. In classical computing, it doesn't do very well as the number of variables uh, scale up. We've had examples where you can see problems that they get to you know, a few hundred variables and they could take all the time in the world to solve on all the computers in the world. It's just not feasible to do that sort of thing. So it's really in those very complex so-called so NP-hard or exponentially um, uh, exponential problems that, that um, we focus on. And examples of where that's useful, or there's, there's a wide variety of different things. So, so like one that we're, we're pretty excited to be working on is in, in uh, cancer therapy and tr trying to find drugs to, to help cure cancer or types of cancer where you're looking at you know, the very detailed molecular interactions of how, um, how cancer exists and, and what you can do to, to stop it. 
uh, at the core of a lot of those problems are these super hard computational problems. And it's not that we're going to do all of that problem. It's, it, generally, it's in a hybrid approach where you're using classical computing resources for what they're best at, and you use the quantum computing resource for what, what it's best at. But other areas where we see those problems are in, in machine learning, which is you know, one of the most exciting things happening in computer science today. Obviously, our, our customer Google is a huge uh, user of that, probably the world's expert in, in machine learning. And that's an area that they're exploring using our machine to, to do machine learning. And, and uh, several of the researchers there believe that uh, fundamentally this could be a, an extremely valuable way of doing machine learning and take it even to the next step and so on. And those problems are all over the place, right? image recognition, drawing inferences from big data, trying to do better. We have so much data and we just don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to draw those inferences or those, those intuitions from that data. And this, this is a tool that helps in that area. And then another you know, completely different area of application would be in, in finance. So um, you know, I used to work for Goldman Sachs and I ran technology for them for, for about a decade and, and they, their, their largest workload from a computing power point of view is in this thing called Monte Carlo simulation where you're trying to model the risk of their balance sheet or their firm and, and, and what would happen under different interest rate scenarios and trying to avoid you know, really bad things happening in the markets and so on. And that requires a huge amount of computation resource. And th that, again, is, an, uh, is a type of application that this is, this is quite good at. So. And I've read that there's a lot of uh, controversy, I suppose, in the academic spheres, as there often is in these kind of spheres, uh, about D-Wave methods and, and whether or not the machine really is uh, necessarily faster or more efficient than you know, classical yeah. algorithms. Yeah. Um, you know, how much can you answer those uh, questions without sort of revealing too much of, I'm sure, your proprietary technology? Well, um, that's a great question, and, and certainly there, there is controversy with any kind of new technology and so on. And uh, there's, so there's a couple, couple of reasons, um, I think, for this is, is particularly acute with a technology like this. First of all, people wonder, you know, how does, how does a company, a commercial company, come out of this, out of the woodwork when there's been so much work going on in quantum computing? And I have some answers for that. But I think the other thing that's important is that you know, we, we, we do publish scientific papers, so peer-reviewed papers, and we actually publish 60 peer-reviewed scientific papers, which I think for a venture-funded startup is probably a world record. So we are trying to help move science forward and contribute to that community and so on. Um, but the, the method that we chose, which actually originally came from MIT, to do this quantum computation, the fundamental theory for it is very different than what most people go to school or study in quantum information theory and quantum computing and so on. So 90% of the rest of the world is focused on a technique called gate model. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times there's not an understanding of the, of the technology that we use. Um, and there's some, you know, and, and it's up to us to, to, you know, to, to be open about that and try to educate people on it and so on. And we do that through the, the peer review process. I have uh, scientists that some, you know, one of our, our really good scientists is on a tour of universities to talk about how we, how we do this and show them the results and so on. So um, we, we will continue to and improve our engagement with the scientific community so that people understand it better. Um, but the, 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 a couple of other reasons why it's, it's a little bit controversial is um, we took a different approach in terms of how we were going to do this, where most of the efforts that we see today are academic based. Um, Jordy Rose and, and, and Eric Ledezinski, the, the co-founders of the company, they, they decided that they were going to uh, use a couple of important different, different techniques. Um, that sound simple, but I think it put us in a pretty good, pretty good position. And one of them was build it using semiconductor technology and, and the manufacturability. So taking advantage of all the great work that's been done in the semiconductor industry in terms of being able to scale from a few transistors out to billions of transistors, do it in that same way using fabs that are you know, available here you know, in the valley and so on. Uh, and from the outset, design it that way. Not design it as a laboratory experiment, but design it as something that's manufacturable. Mm. And it sounds simple, but that's you know, a key uh, decision that was made up front that I think has helped us. And another is, is, is leverage venture capital, right? You know, um, it, this is a sustained effort. It's a very complex projects. It's taken us time, time to do this. We needed to find visionary investors that, that, that you know, were, were uh, 
saw the value in this and, and understood that you know this would be a, a relatively long development, at least on you know typical um, you know venture funded project scale. Uh, and we found folks like, uh, or, or he found us, Steve Jervitson, you know, who, who, who's been with us since uh, uh, probably 2003, so for quite a long time, and, and is a visionary. And so having uh, investors like that, where you're not scrambling, you know, from, for the next academic funding or, you know, this little government grant or whatever, I think has allowed us to do rapid prototyping and, and iteratively building this, this processor that's um, not always a luxury that those folks in academia can afford, right, or, or, or have. So a couple of very simple, or at least seemingly simple principles that, that were put together in the beginning of the company really helped. Another one was the choice of type of quantum computer, this, this so-called adiabatic quantum computer. Uh, all three of those put together have allowed us to build what we've built. Huh. Uh, so. It takes a lot to get to an overnight success, I guess. When, yeah, when yeah, you sell exactly. a machine, there's been a lot that's gone into it. I have a couple other questions I wanted to ask. One, you mentioned how cold these machines have to be. Yeah. Um, I've heard of some, you know, research around superconductors that could possibly, you know, make it a lot easier to run these kinds of things at a more normal temperature, I guess liquid nitrogen or maybe even someday room temperature. Yeah. Are you optimistic about that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a long a, a long-term goal, right? I mean, the, the the technologies that we have today that we uh, partner with our vendors that provide this refrigeration technology, it's still pretty exotic. It's still difficult to get down to the operating temperatures that this machine runs at, which are so-called 20 millikelvin, right. which is minus 273.15 degrees C, where the lowest physical temperature in the universe is minus 273.14 degrees. <laughs> so it's like very, you know, it's very, very close to the, you know, the physical limit of, right. of, of the lowest temperature on the, you know, in the universe. But that's a big risk too for your business, right? Because especially with, you know, you know, global helium shortages and things. I mean, to get something that cold is really, yeah, it, as you it, said, it, difficult it, it, and expensive. It requires these exotic, uh, these exotic refrigerators that are, be, you know, that that have been making improvements. And we have two vendors that we work with that build great equipment, and we've been working with them very closely to improve their technology so that it can be run seven by twenty-four, like a computer does. We're all used yeah. to computers running all the time, not laboratory experiments where most of these kinds of refrigerators are, are used for you know a few months at a time or something like that. So, to, But back to your question, so I think there will be improvements in that refrigeration technology certainly uh, and there are also, as you said, uh, there's lots of research going on into higher temperature superconductors. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not a physicist, but I'm not sure how uh, we'll be able to take advantage of some of those because the what we're really trying to get at, in addition to the superconducting, is lowering the noise and the, um, the interference to that quantum mechanical process that's doing the computation. So inside our machine, the chip is like the size of your fingernail, but there's this little coffee cup sized container that has this really rarefied environment. It runs down at that 20 millikelvin, it has a magnetic vacuum, there's no air in that environment. It's really one of the most, you know, unless there's other intelligent life in the universe, it's the most rarefied environment in the universe. And this machine requires that, you know, not just for superconducting, which is an important part of it, but to reduce the interference so that you're really tapping into the way nature computes. Because nature is doing all of these computations all the time. It's just natural. Right? Yeah. But the, the trick is how do you access that? How do you, you know, how do you tap into it? How do you load a problem into it, read it out, and so on? So, um, I, you know, I think the, the superconducting uh, materials research that's going on may help us in the future but I, I you know I honestly don't know and it's probably you know decades before you know practical usages come out of that kind of uh, technology so as these machines stay somewhat rarefied you know as they continue to be pretty expensive and and accessible to companies like Google um, do you foresee a time when we could have cloud quantum computing absolutely so that I wouldn't have to buy a machine I could access it yeah, so actually we already have that capability today. So when Google first started working with us, they ran a large uh, bunch of problems and experiments completely remotely to machines that we had up in, in Vancouver. So that the physical capability there already exists. And we will, over time, uh, release cloud services to the public that, so that anyone, ultimately I think, you know, I, I say, you know, if you're an iOS developer or you're a developer in the future and you're, you're just trying to decide what's the best way to 
write my application, that, that application developer should be able to use quantum resources as well as they do you know, other cloud resources. That's one of the beauties of the technology today is that we can offer this in the cloud and people don't have to buy this big machine that's you know, in a data center and so on. So it can, I, I believe that you know, over, over the next few years, you know, we can have a ubiquitous kind of access to, to this kind of resource and that will really help people develop clever algorithms and new usages for this new tool. So absolutely, you hit on a very important strategy for us with the quantum cloud access. And, and D-Wave as a company, uh, you've got, as you mentioned, venture capital, over 100 million uh, invested, and just recently this past year, you brought on a CFO with some public company experience. Is an IPO in the cards for Yeah, I brought on uh, Steve Cakebread, who's a great guy, took Salesforce public and Pandora Networks public and great hardware and software experience. So yeah, you know, I, I believe it's a time that we should be looking at ourselves as a public company, just you know, doing the, d having the discipline in the company to operate the company like that. We're becoming a, a more mature company that way. I can't predict what happens in the markets, you know, as you know, and things like that, but certainly we want to line ourselves up for you know, the most optimal kind of financing and, you know, that could be a public offering. And last question here, you know, here in Silicon Valley, we often talk to sort of mobile app developers and people making little games and stuff, which is great and awesome and fun in its own way. Sure. But, um, you know, you're in this quantum computing world. Would you like to see more kind of small startups getting into this space? Is it possible yeah, to I do mean, big I, things? It's sort of an editorial comment of, of, of my one, one kind of disappointment I might have with sort of, uh, not, not so much from the D-Wave perspective, but there are very few investors uh, today that are willing to invest in world-changing technology that's really going to have a large impact on the world. Not that, you know, those game companies and other, you know, great companies like, you know, Twitter and Facebook don't change the way we all operate, but, there, but there's a real lack of groundbreaking kind of research and, and, and things that take more than a few years to develop and, you know, hardware companies and things like that. And it's kind of disappointing to see. I hope the pendulum swings back the other way other way at some point where it becomes more in vogue to, to do more of the science-based uh, uh, research because it's really important for, for us to, to transform science into technology and do that in a most effective way. And that's why I'm excited about D-Wave because I'm passionate about it. I've never done science before. I'm an engineer by background. I've had IT jobs and things like that, uh, run IT companies. But this is really transformational, and the rate to which you can transform pure science like this into technology and product, ultimately, I think is very exciting and will help the world. So that's my editorial comment, anyway. No, it's it's Im an important thing to say. So, um, Vern Brownell, thank you for coming to TechCrunch, Thanks, and uh, keep us posted on D-Wave. I will. Thank you.